you are going to gain so much wisdom and clarity today from this session, Boss Sister, because I have this great life and leadership maxim for you. Oh, it is so good that it was, it's going to give you so much clarity. And I know that you have these times, like I do, where something will just come at us super fast and we've got to make a decision on it all of a sudden. And we're not quite sure what to do, but we do know that we want to make the right decision and we want to make the decision, um, you know, we want to make sure we're not being deceived. How do we know if this thing is from the Lord or if it's from the enemy? How do we know if we're being deceived? Nobody wants that. Nobody's got time for that, right? So this is a great um, life and leadership max because you can use it in life. You can use it in your career. It is awesome. And it's really, it's one of the most, of all the maxims I've shared with women, this is their most favorite. I still get calls today, messages where they have shared how they use this maxim and they immediately knew if it was from the Lord or if this was from the enemy and they knew how to properly answer that situation. You're going to love it. Uh, this is not only episode number 48, but it is also a faith episode. So welcome to the Gina Duke Show podcast. Now, we've all had these situations that come up out of the blue and we don't know. We don't know. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Is this the Lord? Is this the enemy trying to deceive me? And again, we don't have time for that, right? Nobody wants to be deceived. We've got a lot on our plate. We want to make good decisions and we want to stay in step with God. And so this is a great maxim. It's a great maxim. Um, again, a maxim is usually a short pithy sentence that we can use um, in moments where we need clarity. This is actually going to be three sentences, very simple sentences. And um, it's actually more like an anecdotal saying is really what it is. It's not just one sentence, but kind of an anecdotal saying. It's kind of a, something that you'll remember, you know, the way that it flows and whatnot. But before we get on to that maxim, I want to share with you just how important it is if you're looking to have spiritual clarity, if you are feeling like you're just constantly in this fog of not knowing, you know, should I, should I have said yes to this? Should I have said no to this decision? Um, should I change jobs? What, you know, if you just have felt like you've never had the right leading of, is God leading you? Or are you being deceived or whatnot? There is three things that I do recommend that you do in order that you uh, guard against that. And to me, it's again, it's the three legged stool of every Christian should sit there behind upon. And one leg of that is church engagement. We really should be um, in a church body. That is the will of God, according to the New Testament for Christians. And I know a lot of Christians have left the church during the pandemic and have not quite went back, but God expects us to be in fellowship in the way that he has ordered it. And because um, he's always going to honor the order that he establishes. And so I will tell you, you know, I go to a very conservative church and we still have Sunday school. But there's been so many times when I'm reading my Sunday school material or I'm in a Sunday school class and it just continually adds to my wisdom and knowledge of who God is and what he expects. And, and um, you know, even if I'm in a church service uh, where there's preaching and I don't feel like that particular message is for me, like it's not really addressing anything. And that's going on in my world or in my life. Again, just the washing of that word over me encourages me, gives me wisdom. It's just making deposits that I don't even realize. Um, you know, his word will not go out void. And so anytime that we can be with a body of believers, where we can encourage one another, we can do ministry together. We can counsel with one another and have people to go to. So it's very important that we have true church engagement. The other thing is to be in the word of God. Now in my book, Organizing Your Prayer Closet, this is one of the things that I talk about and growing our ability to hear from the Lord. I'm telling you, 
if you are consistently in the word of God, again, whether it's, and think about all the different ways we can be in the word of God. It can be a devotion in the morning. It can be from a Bible study we're doing or a Christian book we're reading. It can be in reading the Bible, obviously. Um, all the things that we can do throughout the day to be in the word of God. In my book, I tell you this, if you are consistently in the word of God, his specific word for you will find you. And this is truth. I've had this happen so many times. Um, and so it's important we're in the word of God. And then it's also important that we live a prayerful life. That we, you know, when it says to, to pray without ceasing, that just means to be in a continual mindset of lifting things up before the Lord. So if I, as I come with them, um, as there's difficulty through the day or there's something nagging at me, if there's a big decision ahead that I know I'm going to have to make, whatever it is, I'm having conversations with the Lord about those things. So first of all, you've got to be, you know, your Christian butt needs to be on that three-legged stool, well-situated, well-seated, Phyllis, on that stool. Uh, because that's really the beginning of where clarity and wisdom is going to come from. And this is the order God has established. This is what, these are the tools, the things that he has given to us for our well-being, okay? So, so don't be ghosting the church. <laughs> don't be neglecting the Bible and scripture. And, um, and don't be ghosting God. Don't be just not talking to him. Uh, you, you're in relationship with the Lord. So treat it as a true relationship. You want to hear from him and you want to be in fellowship with him and his body of believers. And, and you want to be talking to him and, you know, listening to him as well. But sometimes even that seems like that's just too hard. Like I can, you might be thinking, well, I can do all those things, but I still don't feel like I can hear the Lord very well. Or when the situation just pops up out of blue, out of the blue, I don't even know what the Lord's trying to do. If, if he's trying to do anything with that. And so this is a really great maxim. And I'll tell you many years ago, I really felt led by the Lord in this one particular area of my life. And then it fell apart. And then I was really disappointed in the Lord. And I was like, so upset. I'm like, well, apparently I cannot discern your voice. And I was all mad about it and everything. And one of my mentors gave me this book. I don't know if it's in publication anymore, but you can probably still get it. It's by Don Matzat, M-A-T-Z-A-T. -A -A I don't even know I'm pronouncing this correctly. And it's got the funniest title. It's the Lord told me, I think. And if you're on, if you're watching me on YouTube, you can see the cover of the book. The Lord told me, I think. And um, so my mentor gave me this book to really try to help me. And there is, you know, uh, the author provides lots of good stories of how he discerned the Lord was speaking to him about several different things. And uh, so it was really helpful. And actually, the maxim I'm going to share with you today came out of uh, page 147. And 147, he says, um, and he's talking about the book of John, but he says, you know, Jesus is not a cowboy who drives or pushes cattle. And this is where this maxim really came for me after I finished reading this book. This is one of the things that stuck out and I actually made a maxim out of it. And so I'm going to, you know, share that with you. So again, this maxim is like a little anecdotal saying, it's made up of three simple sentences. I'm going to share this share them with you sentence by sentence. Okay, so get ready. Here is the first sentence of this new maxim and um, repeat after me. It says, here it goes, I am a sheep. Now, hold up, hold on, just time out for just a minute. Uh, prior to 2020, um, to say that I was a sheep was not controversial. <laughs> it was not taboo among God's people. But something like we entered this twilight zone in 2020. You know, the pandemic came with a twilight zone. And I just now when I when I hear Christians 
saying that they're not a sheep. I mean, I'm just not sure what's going on. <laughs> so don't pervert <laughs> this original meaning for Christians that we are sheep. He, uh, we see this all through the uh, Old Testament and definitely in the New Testament that we are the sheep. We are like sheep. And so I'm going to tell you, as a Christian, I am a sheep every day of the week. That's my maxim. <laughs> that's my maxim. I am a sheep. And so that's the first part of this, um, of this maxim is I am a sheep. And then the second part of this maxim, the second sentence is, and Jesus is my good shepherd. Jesus is my good shepherd. So as a sheep, I need a shepherd. And it says in the scriptures that Jesus is the good shepherd. And think about this. When you think about, well, what does that mean, really? What does it mean to be a good shepherd? I want you to think about Psalm 23. Psalm 23, you probably, if you haven't read it or you don't know it, I'm sure at funerals you've been exposed to it. It's typically on the back of the little the little visitation card of the deceased. And it says things like this, you know, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in, in soft grass. Now, again, I'm just paraphrasing. He uh, leadeth me uh, through um, the valley of the shadow of death, and I will fear no evil. You know, he takes me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You know, he, he anoint my head and my cup runneth over. It's all of these things that as a good shepherd, the sheep of Jesus experience in his leadership. And so think about when he says, I lead, when he says he leads the sheep beside still waters, that means he's not taking them that, that flock. Uh, or heard that flock near babbling brooks of water that might startle them, that might scare them or make them afraid. He does all these things and the way that he leads them so that they feel peace. You know, when he says that thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Like I feel secure because I know that you can protect me. And so that is the experience that God wants his sheep to have. And it's a picture of feeling at peace. And a lot of times that is how we know when we're in step in with God's spirit, we're feeling a peace about it. Okay. The third sentence is this. Let me say the first two first. I am a sheep. Jesus is my good shepherd and Satan is a cowboy. Now, listen up, listen up. I live in Tennessee. I was raised on a farm. I mean, a legit farm <laughs> with all the farm animals. I had a horse, I had a saddle, I had a cowgirl hat. Um, I, I love me some, you know, good cowgirl, cowboy stuff. You know, I love the shows, all of those things. So I'm not trying to be disrespectful to people who are cowboys. So don't take offense. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to say is that how cowboys wrestle cattle is the exact opposite of how Jesus or how a shepherd leads sheep. Am I right? Am I right? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? It's a completely different experience. And so a lot of times when it's the enemy, it's going to come in wildly. Like think about, think about a cattle just standing there, minding their own business. You know, they're eating grass, they're drinking water. And then all of a sudden these cowboy rustlers come in to herd them and they're just wild eyed. They're just running and they don't even know what's going on and they can't make sense of any of that. That is what the enemy brings to the table in your circumstances. And so remember this, the Lord, he wants to go before us. And I'll, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, how he goes before us and we feel his peace because we're sheep and that's how we are led. But this rustling stuff where we feel rushed and we feel hurried, where we can't even think straight, 
That's not the Lord because he doesn't lead us that way. So like I said, I, I've had so many uh, women just reach out to me and, and tell me their story about how they've used this maxim. I'm going to share one of them with you for Tom's sake. But I had this a young single mom who I mentored for a lot of years. And she would still today tell you I'm her mentor. And I'm glad you know, to take her call anytime. She, she hits me up with, with her newest thing where she's needing a sounding board and needing some you know, someone that is a sister in Christ to kind of help, you know, talk through, talk through the situation. Uh, but years ago, um, when her children were young and, um, she was a single mom and she had this job, but she also had this career path where she wanted to reach being in, in leadership role. And she had done the hard stuff, y'all. She went back to college as a single mom. She'd done all the things and where she's really working toward, her career path. And so she really began to feel like the company that she'd been with for many years, though they had been good to her, they really weren't promoting her. Uh, they were using her in a lot of leadership ways, but not really the official promotion or the money that goes with that. And, you know, uh, money is important, right? We want to be compensated for the duties that we're fulfilling. And we want to be recognized for the level of work that we're producing. And she did not feel like she was getting that. So she decided that she would put her resume out. And so she started sending her resume out and even to some executive recruiters. So one day, an executive recruiter called her up and basically said to her, we have found you a job. This company looked one time at your resume. They want you, almost like unsight, um, unseen. Um, and like, all you've got to do is just get down to their office in Nashville and they just want to meet you and then seal the deal. And she was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And so she's trying to think, you know, she hangs up. Okay, give me a minute. She hangs up from them. She's like, again, she's got this wild eyed thing going on. And she's like, okay, how am I going to get down there? Like I'm at work now, but do I tell my boss I'm taking off the rest of the day? What do I tell them? Do I say I'm going to lunch? It's going to be a long lunch. And then what would I say is the reason? And then what if they go ahead and give me this job and I'm going to start in a couple of weeks, then what I'm going to do with my kids? Because I, you know, I've only got daycare set up after school care for so long and right now. And so she was like, you know, trying to figure out, I mean, again, you can see, if you can see me on YouTube, but if you can understand what I am describing um, through my podcast episode, you know that it it's very much feeling like she's being herded like cattle, right? And she said, Gina, I just stopped. And I said that maxim. She said, I am a sheep. And Jesus is my good shepherd. And Satan is a cowboy. And she's like, I'm feeling herded like cattle right now. So I know this is not the Lord. I mean, just the wisdom that she had in that, in that moment. And she picked the phone up and she called them back. And she said, thank you so much for, you know, pitching my resume. Please let this employer know how much I appreciate that they saw potential in me but I'm not gonna be able to make it. I'm not gonna be able to consider this job because I just don't think this is the right fit for me. And she hung that phone up completely at peace, guilt-free and at peace because she knew she's not going to be herded like cattle because she's not cattle, she's a sheep. You don't know how many times women have come and explained how they've used this maxim in life. Well, here's the deal. It wasn't maybe two or three weeks later that her current employer promoted her with a really good raise. See, Satan, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He was trying to steal that opportunity out from underneath my sweet sister, who already had all of her after school care set up and everything. She had to stay right where she is with people she loves, a job she enjoyed. And she finally got that reward and recognition that she so duly um, deserved. 
and she didn't have to make a move. But see, the enemy was trying to come in and steal, steal from my sister. And she had the wisdom and this great maxim to go, whoa, I'm, I'm not cattle. I'm a sheep and I'm feeling herded like cattle. So I know that's the enemy. That's not the Lord. So I'll tell you about a time, um, you know, what it feels like to be led by sheep, like sheep, you know, because I am a sheep. So years ago, this was in 2008. And I had a couple of thoughts that the Lord was telling me I would be leaving my then, my current job. And after a couple of times of, of having that come to me, I thought, you know what, I'm going to write this down. So in the back of my prayer journal, there's a couple of extra pages. And I wrote at the top of this one blank sheet, leave job, question mark. And I, I made a note of a couple of dates where I felt like the Lord was speaking that to me. So I was going to start praying about that because I felt like the Lord may be speaking to that. I didn't feel like he was saying, quit your job. I felt like he was kind of cueing me that I may be leaving the current job that I'm in. This was early August. Now, every time that I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying this to me, I wrote it down. So for instance, um, like I was at uh, my daughter who both, I have two daughters, but when the younger one was uh, still in youth, for some reason on a Wednesday night, or maybe it could have been a Sunday night, there was a night that I was up with the youth group and they were having their worship and they were playing a song I was not familiar with. But I remember there was these words in that song that says, you will labor no more. And I didn't, I didn't feel like the Lord was saying, you know, you're about to never have to work again <laughs> a day in your life. I, but I felt like the Holy Spirit was drawing my attention to that, that I was going to labor no more. And I felt like he was saying, you're leaving this job you're in. And it had been a challenging job, no doubt. So, you know, I came home, I wrote the date down, I wrote that song down. And, and then every time there was a, something in, and I, I don't mean that every time I heard something like that, that I wrote it down. It was a combination that I heard something to that effect. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was, you know, tapping on my heart going, did you get this? Pay attention, pay attention to this. And I would write it down. So I did that August, September, October. No, I mean, so for months, I'm kind of writing this down, keeping up. Anytime I feel like the Lord is, is kind of letting me know I'm going to be lose. I'm going to be leaving this job. So in January of the 1st of January, like January 9th, I think of, uh, 2009, um, I was let go. And during the great recession, me along with some other managers. And, um, even though I didn't expect it necessarily that day, you know, the, the director came in and let us go. We had, we actually had two plants close by and one plant, they had just, um, it was really, that plant was dedicated to a General Motors facility. And they had, again, Detroit was drawn up. So anybody that wanted to move south, this company was relocating them. And so when the Great Recession came, that Spring Hill GM plant closed and they took the Chevy Traverse, I think is what they were making at the time, back up north during the recession. And so that closed that facility. So this company that had all of these people, they had newly relocated. Um, they had an extra HR manager and he had been with them since he was in college as an intern. And they had just moved him and his family down here. So who do you think they eliminated? They eliminated me who'd been with this company, you know, only about three years where he had been with this company for many years. Um, and so he, he, uh, my, my um, company, my facility stayed open because it had a variety of different automotive uh, OEMs that it provided parts to. And so they moved him into my job. So anybody that had a duplicate job, they released and kept the people they had just moved down from Detroit that had been with them 
for many years. And I understand that. Uh, but I'll never forget that director of human resources. Like he had tears in his eyes when he was telling me he was going to have to, you know, sever my employment. And I remember being cool as a cucumber because see the Lord for many months had been saying, see, he led me. He didn't run me up against a babbling brook. He had been leading me beside still waters, letting me know in my spirit that this may be coming up. So I was not surprised. I was prepared. Um, then on my way home, I thought, now I think I'm going to stop by my church and let my pastor know that I'm going to be available, that if they need me to um, go to do some visitation, if they need any special projects, I'll be glad to help them because I think it's going to be quite a while before I get another job. And it was, it was like another 18 months or so. And I met with him and I shared with him my news and he's like, I'm so sorry to hear that. But then he goes on to say this, he goes, but actually we talked about you today in our staff meeting. Actually, we discussed you today about taking on our, our role as women's ministry director. Now that was not a role that I was thinking about taking or ever wanting. As a matter of fact, I had thought about that role before because I feel called to women's ministry, but see, I feel more called to minister to women, not so much to lead a ministry where I'm bringing in other women to minister to them at conferences or retreats or whatnot. That, that had always been my thought. I was never really interested in leading a women's ministry at my church, but I knew this was not a coincidence. Again, I knew the Lord was up to something. He was doing a new thing and he was going before me. So I knew that even though this was something I didn't think I was interested in, I didn't feel like I had a plan for it. I knew that God was doing something new because he'd been preparing me for quite some time for this very day. And I liked how, you know, when I went the next week and I met with my, the pastor that I would be reporting to in this position, you know, he didn't try to guilt me in it. He didn't try to make me commit to something. He really was like, I just want you to pray about it. Again, it was a very peaceful thing. And I, I went ahead and told him in that meeting, you know, I don't think that I'm the one uh, to lead your women's ministry because I've never really felt led in that direction. And more importantly, I don't have a vision for it. And I'm typically what I would characterize as a visionary leader. That means that I, I have to feel like God's given me a vision on how I would accomplish this thing. Because look, you don't want what Gina Duke's got. <laughs> You want what the Lord has got. And Gina Duke just gets to, you know, steward it. Um, but I said, but I will pray about it. I, I don't think the Lord's leading me this way, but I will pray about it. Well, well, Phyllis, it was a few nights later and I had, I was already in the bed getting ready to go to sleep. And you know how sometimes as you're laying down, get ready to go to sleep, your mind starts thinking about just all kinds of various things, things that you're working on, things that might be worrying you. You're just thinking about all kinds of things. Well, all of a sudden, it was like the Lord began to speak to me. Like in my mind, I was all of a sudden had these ideas and I wasn't even trying to really think about it. I mean, I committed to praying for it. I had prayed for it, but Right then and there, I was trying to go to bed, <laughs> but all of a sudden I'd had these random ideas about church before, like organizational things. And I actually had written these ideas down over the years, but they were just very random thoughts that I didn't even see them as associated with one another. Well, lo and behold, all of a sudden he's like bringing all these ideas to my mind and I realized he's saying, this is exactly how I want you to do women's ministry at your church. And I had to get up out of the bed. I was practically up all night. I was typing or, or you know, word processing and Microsoft Word, all these ideas, exactly how everything would work, how it would all flow together. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And I was excited about it. 
because I knew this is a God thing. And I was really like, just so excited about the ideas. Like I'd been excited about these random ideas that I'd had for years, but not knowing where they would fit. Why would I even try to implement these things at church? You know, so again, he led me to this moment and I knew, I knew it was him. I knew this was a God thing because he had led me there and I was a sheep and he was the good shepherd. He led me there. So you can see how if I was not open to staying in step with the Lord, that three-legged stool I've already talked to you about and all the years of just random things of just writing things down and making notes, even if it didn't make sense at the time, just paying attention. And then, you know, having this thought that I think the Lord's saying I'm going to leave my job soon and writing all that down. You can see how the Lord, even though like most of us would say when we lose our job, that's a shocker. But no, it was it was not a shocker to me. It wasn't a shocker to me. Um, he led me through this process uh, to where I knew that it was him and I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. And so this is a great maxim. Now, again, it may not, it may not work for you in every situation, uh, but this is something that you put back in your, you know, you know, it's for your equipping. You put this back in your toolbox because there are difficult things that come up in life out of left field that we really did not see coming. You know, sometimes it's the death of a loved one. Sometimes it's it's a divorce where our spouse leaves us. Um, but I will tell you, even in those times of, um, I know that the Lord has spoke to me about upcoming changes in my life through other believers, through other people. Um, but again, the overarching thing, the overarching theme of our life is that it, it you know, we will have trouble. I believe that's John 16, 33. Where Jesus says, you will have trouble in this life, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He says, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so, but for most things that you go through in life where you're getting something out of left field, you need to really evaluate. And the only way you can properly evaluate is if, you're, if your little Christian Heine is on that three, you know, is seated firmly on that three-legged stool. When you get these things to come, you'll be able to evaluate them through the through this maxim. I am a sheep. That means I'm I'm led. And I'm led by a good shepherd. And I should feel some peace about whatever this is. And I should feel like he's gone before me. He's paved the way. I can get through this. Even when we lose loved ones, uh, I've seen so many people sometimes go through this thing and they just know the Lord is with them. And they have a piece about it. Now, I don't want to put that on you for, for every situation. And you feel like, you know, something's wrong with you. If you lose a loved one and you're devastated. Because remember, um, Mary and Martha, when Lazarus died, remember Mary just was devastated. And she had spent the most time with the Lord. And she threw herself at his feet. And he, he wept with her. He wept with her. but. For the most part, this maxim is going to give you a lot of wisdom and clarity through these instantaneous moments of decision. And I just want you to say to yourself these words. I am a sheep. Jesus is my good shepherd. And that Satan, he's a cowboy. <laughs>